So I'd just like to introduce our speakers very, very briefly. Uh, two people I've known for a few years in one case and a number of years in the other. Two very, very talented criminal lawyers uh, who have some very interesting uh, perspectives on a complex issue. Um, first off, uh, to give the paper, um, Rebecca Williams um, of Pembroke College, Oxford, uh, whose list of expertise is far too wide for me to discuss, but criminal law being one of the highest, along with public law, restitution and EU law. And to give the comment, uh, Julian Knowles, QC of Matrix Chambers, um, a, well, I'm not going to list all the things that uh, Chambers and Partners describe him as, but um, to, to, to summarise it as a very, very good criminal lawyer would probably be a start. So, Becca. Thank you very much, Matt. So thank you for that introduction, um, and thank you, as Andrew said, to um, you and to Finley, Paul and Mark for organising this. Um, it's very so exciting and not a little daunting to be the first person to talk to you um, in this new series, so it's a real pleasure to do that. So what I want to talk to you about... Um, is the question of whether, when a statute requires intent, what exactly that might include. If I impose conditions on my intent, so I intend to go ahead but only if X something, does that count as intending or not for the purposes of the statutory mens rea requirement that I must have intent for a particular offence? And I think at the moment the current law is struggling with the concept of conditional intent, particularly in relation to inchoate and complicity offences, which is what I'm going to talk about. In some instances where the statute says that it requires intent, conditional intent does suffice, um, and in others it does not. So what I'm going to do is just to give a quick account of what the current situation is before moving on to look at how we might try and make more sense of this area going forwards. So if we start off with conspiracy, here the picture is particularly complicated for two reasons, and the first is because in conspiracy the issue can arise in two different ways. It can go to the actus reus of whether there's an agreement or not, um, as well as to the mens rea. So section 1A of the 77 Act requires that the defendants should agree that a course of conduct shall be pursued which will necessarily amount to or involve the commission of any offences by one or more parties to the agreement. So, of course, the question then is, if the agreement is conditional, will it necessarily lead to the commission of an offence? Now, in O'Hordmoyle, and I'm going to apologise right now for my pronunciation of that case, and if anybody can correct me, I would be really delighted to be corrected. Um, but I will, I will stick with that unless and until I'm told otherwise. So, in O'Hordmoyle, the court held that an agreement to bomb a building if the IRA abandoned a ceasefire did fulfil the necessity requirement. Similarly, in the case of Reed, the court held that an agreement to help the victim commit suicide, if he couldn't be helped any other way, would count as a conspiracy to assist suicide. So in principle, it does seem, at least initially, as if conditional agreements do satisfy that necessity requirement. But in Reed, Lord Justice Donaldson also suggested Obiter that an agreement to drive from London to Edinburgh within a certain amount of time wouldn't be a conspiracy to break the speed limit if it could be done without speeding in the event of, as he said, exceptionally light traffic. Now, we don't know exactly what he meant by that, but it might potentially mean that there are some examples of conditional agreements which might not, perhaps, fulfil the necessity requirement. If we move on and look at the mens rea of conspiracy, section 1-2 of the Criminal Law Act says that the parties must intend or know the relevant circumstances. But of course, if there's an element of conditionality, they might not intend or know that the relevant unlawful circumstance will be present. So, for example, in Saïk, the defendant operated a bureau de change and was charged with conspiring to convert the proceeds of drug trafficking and or criminal conduct. But since he'd only suspected, rather than intending or knowing that he was laundering the proceeds of crime, a majority of the House of Lords said that was insufficient to found liability for conspiracy. So this gives us the second reason for complexity here, which is that all this means that in some cases conditional agreements will be found to be conspiracies, but in other cases they won't. And in the paper, I argue that those distinctions are neither defensible nor, I think, are they particularly coherent. Now, I've done my best to make sense of the relevant cases in the paper. I'm not going to go into that in detail now, but I'm very happy to do that, and it might be useful in the discussion. At best, as we've seen, there is a distinction between offences involving conditional circumstances like Saïk, which seem not to count as conspiracies, 
and offences involving result or behavioural offences, which will. But at worst, if we factor in that over to example of driving from London to Edinburgh in Reed, then maybe even some behavioural offences, uh, behavioural conspiracies are going to fall outside the law too. So the picture for conspiracy is complex and it may involve making decisions and distinctions on the basis of the kind of actus reus element at issue, conduct, result and circumstances, which again, I think are not particularly well justified and have the potential to be arbitrary. If we move on then to look at attempts, there was some early case law like the AG's references 1 and 2 of 79, which held that, for example, conditional intent to steal from a bag would be sufficient. But then more recently in Pace and Rogers, the Court of Appeal had to consider two scrap metal dealers who were caught buying purportedly stolen scrap metal as part of a sting operation. Now, the defendants um, suspected, but of course didn't intend or know that the metal was stolen. And the Court of Appeal just said that's not sufficient to fulfil the men's requir men's rare requirement of knowledge or intent for attempts. They didn't go on to ask whether they had intent conditionally intended to buy stolen scrap metal in the sense that they would have gone ahead with the sale if it had turned out that it was stolen. So conditional intent doesn't therefore currently seem to suffice for liability for attempts if Pace and Rogers is to be followed. Now, for offences contrary to the Serious Crimes Act 07, on the other hand, Section 497 of the Act specifically provides that for Sections 45 and 46, it is sufficient for the defendant to believe that the offence or one or more of the offences will be committed if certain conditions are met. So where does that leave section 44? Do we say, well, conditional intent is excluded there because it's not specifically provided for in 49.7? That only mentions 45 and 46. Well, as with many aspects of this statute, the answer is not exactly clear, but it does seem unlikely that the drafter intended that, and it seems more likely that they were just assuming that, of course, conditional intent would count for the section 44 version, and therefore they didn't need to specify it rather than that they were somehow trying to exclude it specifically. And, of course, um, the most famous recent statement about conditional intent comes from that Supreme Court decision already mentioned by Andrew um, on accessory liability in Jogi. Now, Baroness Hale had, of course, dissented in the House of Lords decision in Saik on the basis that she agreed with David Ormerod's current legal problems article saying that conditional intent should be sufficient in that context. So maybe we shouldn't be wholly surprised that a Supreme Court, including Baroness Hale in Jogi, held that in cases of secondary liability arising out of a prior joint criminal venture, it will also be necessary to draw the jury's attention to the fact that the intention to assist and indeed the intention that the crime should be committed may be conditional. So where all this leaves us is that conditional intent is sufficient for accessory liability, probably for liability under the SCA 07, and for some conspiracies, but it's not sufficient for other conspiracies or for attempts. And that situation, I think, is at least inconsistent and no reason or justification for that distinction is being suggested that seems plausible. So my argument, therefore, is that we ought to reform the law in two ways. Firstly, for the purposes of conspiracy, it should be made clear that that necessity requirement in the Actus Reis does include agreements that a course of conduct shall be pursued or shall on certain conditions be pursued, which, if carried out in accordance with the defendant's intentions, would necessarily lead to the commission of an offence. That deals with the um, actus reus aspect. As for mens rea across the offences, I argue that whenever a statute says that intention is required to fulfil mens rea, that should include conditional intent. This is because, in fact, all, or almost all, intents are actually conditional to some extent. So I only intended to come to this seminar on the basis that I wasn't bedridden with food poisoning or one of my children wasn't in hospital or anything like that. Very few intents are really wholly unconditional in the sense that we intend to go ahead with them come what may. And so when the law says it requires intent, it cannot possibly be understood as requiring that kind of come what may unconditional intent. Otherwise, as the Court of Appeal put it in Mills, nobody would ever be convicted. Now, the only exception to this, I argue, the only kind of condition placed on intent which should prevent liability is the one which is identified by the US Model Penal Code. And that is an intent to proceed with a plan only if it can be carried out legally. So what objections might there be to what I'm proposing? Well, the first might be the argument that it's difficult to distinguish conditional intent from recklessness. But I think that can be done. 
So first of all, as David points out, recklessness is a kind of static, one-shot picture of the defendant's state of mind. What does D for C right now? Does D for C that B might not consent or the property might be stolen or whatever it is? Whereas conditional intent specifies not just what the defendant foresees right now, but what they would do should that eventuality go on to arise. So as David says, there would be no point in returning to them to clarify their state of mind if the circumstance materialised, they've already declared it. Recklessness, by contrast, I argue, involves foreseeing the risk, but actually stupidly relying on it not eventuating. So conditional intent is this even if illegal intent, the preparedness to go ahead even if the event involves illegality, whereas recklessness is about saying, well, I've seen the risk, but it's not going to happen, it's going to be fine, I'm going to be able to go ahead. So even if we think recklessness and conditional intent can be separated theoretically, can they be separated in practice in a way that a jury could understand? And this is one of the reasons I'm really glad to have the chance to be here and talk to you about this, because it means I get to talk both to people from academia and from practice, and I'm particularly looking forward to that in the questions. But again, I think my working hypothesis is that this can be done. So the Supreme Court in Jogi specifically pointed out that juries frequently have to decide questions of intent, including conditional intent, by a process of inference from the facts and circumstances proved. So the key distinction is the one that I draw on the handout, which I'm hoping you have. If D2 has sold a baseball bat to D1, there are, I think, three possibilities. One is that either it never even occurred to D2 that this bat is going to be used outside of the circumstance of playing baseball, or even D2 might have very carefully specified that this bat is never to be used outside of playing baseball. One option is that as D2 sold it to a perfectly plausible looking person, they might have thought, well, they could potentially use it for some nefarious purpose, but that's not really going to happen, and you know, it's perfectly fine for me to take this risk because it's not really going to eventuate. And the third possibility is that D2 is perfectly aware that D1 may use the bat to beat up B and is perfectly happy to go ahead with the sale whether or not that happens. Now, in situation one, D2 has no mens rea at all. That's one of those only if legal type situations. Situation two, the well, it might happen, but it's not going to, so I can go ahead on that basis. That's recklessness, which, of course, is insufficient for mens rea. And in situation three, that's the one where D2 has this even if illegal conditional intent, which I argue does fulfil that mens rea requirement of intent. And there does seem to be discussion in the existing cases, which does suggest that these scenarios can be distinguished in practice. For example, in Pace and Rogers, there's discussion of one of the plaques being a bit naughty and genuinely stolen. So it doesn't seem impossible to argue that the defendants had conditional intent in that case. Similarly, I don't think it seems very likely that the attempted rapist in Khan would definitely have stopped if he'd known for a fact that the victim was not consenting. And Baroness Hale clearly thought that Sykes' initial guilty plea was explicable on the basis that he'd been prepared to go ahead even if illegal, i.e. even if he was indeed laundering the proceeds of crime. So it doesn't seem to me, at least initially, as if it will be impossible for juries to figure out which of the three scenarios I've suggested is actually going on in a particular case. That then leaves the question of why we should bother. Why not just accept that recklessness is going to be sufficient um, and have done with that? Well, I think there's a series of reasons why we shouldn't take that step. First of all, recklessness is sort of single snapshot that I described to you earlier. That cannot distinguish properly between an only if legal and even if illegal state of mind. If D foresees that B might not consent, as David says, that says nothing at all about what D would do if in fact it turns out that B does not consent. Secondly, it's not going to solve the problem for us across the board. So even if we were going to accept recklessness in relation to circumstance elements of the offence, like whether um, the victim consents or not, whether the property is stolen or not, and so on, behavioural elements of the offences like speeding, assisting, appropriating, those kinds of things would pre presumably still need intent. So we would still have our question of does conditional intent count as intent for, in relation to those remaining behavioural elements. And of course, then we would be reintroducing that distinction I'm trying to move away from, where we distinguish between different circumstances on the basis of the element of the offence um, going on, which is a distinction I've been trying to eliminate. It's also difficult to imagine that we would think recklessness would be sufficient for impossible offences. Let's imagine for a minute the mirror image of Khan. So this time we have an attempted rapist who has achieved penetration, but the victim actually turns out 
to be consenting after all. Would we really think it sufficient if the law only required the defendant to be reckless in those circumstances? And yet if we say, OK, well, that's all right, we'll require intent for those circumstances of impossible attempts, but we will accept recklessness for circumstances of possible ones, then that seems to me inconsistent with the fact that both the 81 and the 77 Acts are about treating impossible and possible offences equally. So it doesn't seem to me to fit very well with that. And finally, of course, Jogi has conclusively held that recklessness is insufficient for accessory liability. So then we'd have to say to ourselves, OK, well, can we find a reason why it should be sufficient in the inchoate if it's not sufficient in accessory liability and whether there's any justification for what would otherwise be that inconsistency? And I, again, think there isn't. So in conclusion, I'm arguing that we should recognise that across the board, when a statute says that it requires intent, that should be regarded as being satisfied by a finding of conditional intent. And indeed, that must be what the statutes mean, because so few intents really are genuinely unconditional. That then gives us a solution which is not over-inclusive. It also gives us consistency between different kinds of actus reus elements, different kinds of offence, and between possible and impossible inchoate offences. Thank you. Well, someone who certainly knows a lot about uh, Jody and Ruddock and many other aspects will be Julian. <laughs> well, thank you very much for um, asking me to respond today, and thank you, Rebecca, for that um, excellent presentation. It's a difficult area, I think uh, we'd all agree, but a, a fascinating one. Well, as Matt mentioned, um, my principal exposure to this topic did come in the case of uh, Jody and Ruddock. I argued the case on behalf of um, Mr. Ruddock. We're all familiar uh, with the scenario in Jogi and Ruddock, but for those who, who may not be, the court was concerned with the principle of parasitic accessorial liability. In other words, the scenario where the principal P and the secondary party S agree to commit one crime A, uh, and in the course of that, uh, the principal commits a different crime B. And the issue before the court was, what is the basis of liability in criminal law, or what should the proper basis of liability B. The law as it stood prior to the decision was as established in Chan Ring Su and Powell and English, which was that the secondary party was liable if he merely foresaw but did not intend, and even if positively did not want, the principal P to commit the secondary crime B. On behalf of Mr Ruddock, we challenge whether foresight should be a rule of law as opposed to merely a rule of evidence from which the jury might depending on the circumstances, be able to conclude that the secondary party did intend that the crime be committed, or, or strictly the test intended to assist or encourage P to commit crime B, or, although the court said in practice the two would be the same. Now, such a scenario necessarily involves contingencies because the issue of liability arises as a result of a deviation from the enterprise on which PNS initially embarked. In other words, it's therefore concerned with liability crystallising at a later time, T2, by reference to S's state of mind at an earlier time, uh, T1. The scenario therefore knocked firmly on the door of conditional intents. Uh, and I remember as I began the submissions uh, on behalf of Mr Ruddock and set, in it, set, set out uh, the signposts of where I was going to go and the principal pieces uh, of the argument when I got to and intent is enough. I remember Lord Toulson jumping in immediately and saying, oh, Mr Knowles, you include within that, don't you, conditional intents, the we'll shoot if we have to sort of scenario. Uh, and I readily uh, agreed with that proposition. It seemed to me then and seems to me still that my answer was indeed a, a correct answer uh, and that conditional intent is and should be for these purposes sufficient intent to establish uh, liability. There's a forthcoming paper from Dr. Child um, at Sussex University uh, who takes issue with whether conditional intent in this context really is a conditional intent as, as he would have it. Uh, but certainly I would strongly advocate that conditional intent in this context uh, it is sufficient uh, intent. Uh, Becker in her paper uh, suggests that it was what Lady Hale said in her dissent in Saik um, which was, uh, might have been the motivation uh, for the discussion of conditional intent in Jogi and Ruddock, and that um, might be so. The judgment in Jogi and Ruddock was given or drafted by Lords Toulson and Lords Hughes, but no doubt 
the, the other justices also had an input, and so what Becker says um, may well be right. But let's not forget that the old cases, which principally motivated and inspired the decision in Jogi and Ruddock and the return uh, to the jurisprudence as it was prior to 1984, uh, was based on old cases where one sees, I think, fairly clearly conditional intents as we would understand it. Those old cases, the old poacher and gamekeeper cases reflecting the social conditions of the 19th century, uh, in my view, can be seen through one prism uh, as cases of conditional intent. So in the case of Skeet, uh, which was one of the principal cases we looked at and debated and discussed in Jogi and Ruddock, dates back to 1866. It was said there would be liability in S, quote, where there is evidence of a felonious design to carry out the unlawful purpose at all hazards uh, and whatever may be the consequences. In other words, where the agreement between the poachers was to shoot the gamekeepers uh, to, in order to effect an escape if necessary. That clearly has an echo of the language of conditional intents as we would now um, understand it. Uh, this theme uh, was picked up in the judgment in Jogin Ruddock uh, in an expansion of the proposition that was put to me in argument. Uh, the bank robbers who attack the bank, where one or more of them is armed, and no doubt hope that it will not be necessary to use the guns, but it may be a perfectly proper inference that all were intending that if they met resistance, the weapons should be used with the intent to do grievous bodily harm at least. Different social conditions, bank robbers rather than poachers and gamekeepers, but I think the same idea being expressed. Now, in her paper, Becker extensively analyses, we've had a taste of it, and if you haven't um, uh, had the opportunity to read the full paper yet, please prepare for a, a three-course banquet, because it really is uh, worth savouring. In her paper, Becker extensively analyses whether conditional intent uh, differs from recklessness and poses the issue, quote, condition, conditional intent and recklessness, the distinction in practice. Uh, being cynical on the back of the Court of Appeals post Jogi and Ruddock decision in Johnson and others, uh, where the Court of Appeal, they considered six cases uh, of differing facts, five cases of murder uh, and one uh, case of non-murder, um, uh, and considered would a Jogi and Ruddock style direction uh, have made a difference. And in each and every case, um, the Court of Appeal, pretending that they were a jury sitting at whatever crown court it was, said, no, it wouldn't have made any difference whatsoever. Uh, we can divine from the jury's uh, one-word verdict of guilty what factual conclusions uh, they must have reached on the various routes that were available to them. And notwithstanding they were given an erroneous direction of law, as we now know, it wouldn't have made a jot of difference. Uh, despite the decision um, in Johnson, it is, I think, still meritorious and has value to consider uh, whether recklessness and intent and conditional intent uh, really are um, different concepts. The question might be an empty one post-Johnson. Uh, we await, or I await, uh, a case with better facts to come before the Court of Appeal where we can really see uh, if Joe Ginn Ruddock is going to make a difference. So perhaps it is still worth posing um, the question. And as a practitioner, uh, the question in my mind is, uh, how can the trial judge in her summing up best bring the distinction home to the jury, the distinction between recklessness on the one hand and intent or conditional intent on the other. It, it, it seems to me it's not sufficient, given the complexities in this area, for the trial judge just simply to say, well, members of the jury, you'll know intent when you see it. It seems to me that more um, will be um, required, and it also seems to me uh, that something more than the traditional wool-in uh, inevitable consequences approach is also going to be required. Uh, David and his colleague Carl Laird uh, have considered this, quiz, this question of jury directions in their recent paper in the Criminal um, Law Review uh, last year, which is certainly obviously worth a read. The Supreme Court um, gives a clue. We wait and see how the directions will uh, work out properly in due course. But the Supreme Court give one clue uh, in their judgment. At paragraph 93, uh, as Becker's uh, already referred to, the court said that jury, quote, juries frequently have to decide questions of intent, including conditional intent by a process of inference. Uh, the court said, quote, when the question of whether D2, who joined with others in a venture to commit crime A, shared a common purpose or common intent, the two are the same. So there we have an amalgam of, or a melding of purpose and intent. The two are the same, which included, if things came to it, the commission of crime B, 
the offence or type of offence with which he is charged and which was physically committed by D1. They, they said the time on, in that scenario, the quote, time honoured way, I'm inviting the jury to consider the question is to ask the jury whether they are sure that D1's act was within the scope of the joint venture, that is, whether D2 expressly or tacitly agreed to a plan, and I think those are the key words, agreed to a plan, which included D1 going as far as he did and committing crime B if the occasion arose. So the court made agreement to a plan uh, the essence of what is meant by conditional intention uh, and be, being a practitioner uh, and being someone um, who is involved in this field on, on the ground and in the field um, our formulation that one might see emerging in the directions is this concept of a plan and agreement to a plan uh, as being a form of conditional intent so the court in my view made agreement to a plan the essence of what it meant by conditional intention in this context at least and in that way distinguished it from Chan Wing Sue-style recklessness, i.e. foresight falling short of agreement to a plan. So in Becker's um, baseball bat um, example, uh, it would be the, the third uh, uh, situation that they were talking about, agreement to a plan. D2 sells D1 a baseball bat, foreseeing that it might be used for baseball, or it might be used to injure someone. D2 is happy to go ahead with the sale um, non the less. Well, happy or not, if they go along with the sale, um, arguably they've agreed um, to the plan. So that's what I think the Supreme Court had in mind uh, when they used um, that language. No doubt a post jogi direction taking account of Woolin um, will also make clear to the jury that the level of foresight on behalf of the secondary party uh, is a key indicator as to intention. So if you merely contemplate uh, but at a low level it might not be enough, but I, I would uh, anticipate a fuller direction would say something to the jury along the lines of, well, the greater the level of contemplation up, uh, as to what D2 had, as to what D1 might do, um, the easier it will be for the jury um, to infer that there was intention um, which is required. Uh, but we wait to see um, whether Jogi and Ruddock, fascinating to lawyers though it might be, uh, we wait to see whether it will really have a practical effect on the ground. Thank you.